Today on TQA Weekly, I explain why Linux users have issues with drivers and hardware in general. Welcome to TQA Weekly. I'm your host, Steve Smith, aka Z Axis, and let's get straight to the topic. Linux and wireless devices, and all devices for this matter, have a long standing issue with drivers and man hardware manufacturers, and a continued reluctance to create device drivers for the Linux world. This is my pet peeve, and let's look at my four voodoos four or five issues I have to do with the environment and several solutions that I have for you, especially you the user like me, the Linux user. So first voodoo would have to be that the, my basic pet peeve, and I must not be alone, is basically companies are reluctant to give us drivers. They have proprietary technology. They don't want to give us the port signal information. They don't want to tell us which ports, how they connect, what the technology is. They don't want to basically allow a third party user to create a driver for it. So we have to guess. So this is the first voodoo to wireless networking. The reason why we have issues with some of these wireless drivers is the wireless driver is a guesstimate. It works, but not as well as if we had the information in the first place. The second reason, my second voodoo with wireless networking, is the non-standardization of technology as a whole. These companies make their own proprietary technology that works great within all their hardware, but not outside. There are discrepancies in signals because they're not using the same technologies. This makes the signal unreliable. And I know very well that they don't want to leap outside their swimming pool into the ocean because they'll get sued. So it's understandable why they won't do this. But at one point, we the clients are going to have to look them down the throat and say, you know what, stop suing each other and play ball. The third voodoo, the biggest of all issues that I have, which has to do with standardization as a whole, has to do with the fact that they have incomplete, inadequate, or dangerous hardware and signal specifications that come with pointless and dangerous and even mandatory technologies like PayPass. WEP and the worst and most notorious WPS, the whole to WPA encryption, which is encryption WPA, but WEP is treated as encryption even despite the fact that it is far from ever being close to it. So having these standardizations of technologies that are pointless, useless, incomplete, and dangerous does harm the ability for us to have a way at making a better driver because we don't even know what these technologies are supposed to be or they're so vague or dangerous we don't necessarily want to put them in either and my final voodoo that we'll analyze which has to do with the fact that in most countries all hardware must accept interference that can cause issues or may even damage equipment this is um yeah this is the stupidest thing i've ever seen in my life i see it in every single freaking manual must accept interference that may cause undesirable effects that may damage the equipment. Basically, we're buying machines that can break the first day we use it from normal usage due to environmental effects because, and this is how I understand it, the manufacturer has to follow standardizations and rules that indicate that he is not allowed to insulate and protect his machine unless the person has a license to use an insulated device. How do we break this down for the normal user? Your cordless phone and microwave can interfere with your wireless signal, so around supper time or whenever you're making a pizza pocket or cooking some sort of meal, whether it's vegetarian or meat again. Um, Simply using these other devices will cause your wireless networking to fail, decrease, become less reliable. And they're this way because they're not allowed to insulate or shield them from external influences. 
This affects more wireless, whether it would be shielded or not. But if you look at like the GPS industry and that other internet company that was broadcast down, all these GPS equipment could have been easily modified by shielding them, but they're not necessarily allowed to shield them for fear that they become more reliable and less susceptible to interference. So that is my fourth and last voodoo. Now, why would devices obviously not have to do it with this, all these four, but why would other devices like signals from ethernet or wireless anyway, have issues outside of my four primary issues. And this would have to be with positioning of your wireless router, which is if you put it too far away or have too many walls in between, it would either degrade or weaken or become inaccessible or too far away. So positioning is very important. And also signal strength, you can adjust it depending on the router and the manufacturer, but in the case of mine, I can boost my signal strength quite a bit higher and I can only go through three walls. So signal strength becomes an issue and there are solutions, but it will depend on your wallet. Obviously, it is easier to move your router than it is to pay for these things. So the first one is signal strength versus distance. If you're reading my podcast show notes, you can buy a high gain directional antenna for your router and your device that you wish to connect with over a longer distance. The negatives are costs more than 100 mostly for each. You may very well need two, one for each device, the router and the device you wish to communicate with. They are directional, so you have to point it directly at each other. Uh, this means you may have to get a kind of tripod for both of these devices on top of that. And it is directional, which is bad. But here's the thing. You have a stronger signal over a longer range. I have seen it work as far as four kilometers with a wireless and router in a hyper-directional antenna array. It is so directional that you go one millimeter out and you're disconnected, but it works and it maintains the speed at really cool speeds. But like I said, really hard to connect. Another way to increase the distance of the signal is by using a repeater, which isn't that expensive depending on your router. You only need to buy another one of your router. And basically you run around, do some uh, war hacking to find your wireless signal strengths in the house. You can use your laptop for this. And you find the point that is closest to where you want to get your signal to be strong, that is still within the strong zone. And you connect the second one there, and that will boost your signal by actually augmenting the range completely. The bad part is, is you still have to buy a second router to do this. The good thing is, is if it's a cheap enough router, it's not that much. It costs less than a high gain directional antenna. You will lose half your bandwidth doing this though. So depending on what you're doing, this might not change anything. If you're Facebooking or Twittering or whatever, this doesn't change anything for you. If you're watching Netflix, it wholeheartedly depends on what you're doing on your network at that time and what kind of network you're running. So it does cut the bandwidth in half. There is a hybrid solution to that one, which is a wired wireless signal repeater, which is basically the same idea. You get two routers, but you need to use an ethernet cable in between and ethernet can theoretically go up to a thousand feet, maybe more without a significant degrade in signal strength, not like wireless anyway. And this makes it possible for you to connect different nodes in bigger places using the same SSID and username, password, basically combination, and allow everybody to connect in between each other. You can either even wireless multiple hotspots together and make the zone extremely large, or you can make hotspots that are localized over longer space and decide where your wireless connections are accessible. Now, another way to make it very easy for you to get signal strength and reliability is to buy from the same vendor. In my case, it's D-Link. So everything is D-Link except for the laptop. I can't do anything about that. But all the rest of the hardware is D-Link, which means that everything that connects to it has the same 
signal spectrum that is expected from D-Link for us to connect to and have all those little nifty reliability and strengthening of signals and all that. Everything, because it comes from the same company, is better, more reliable. This works for any company. If you have Linksys, you get Linksys router, Linksys modems, Linksys antennas. By the way, you can get directional antennas from these companies. So having them all together, all the same company, makes it more reliable, easier to get technical support for, and basically, you get a better experience out of it because everything's the same. That is basically what it comes down to. Everything is the same, all the same proprietary specs on all the hardware. Now for Linux, all you're gonna have to do is Google it. Yeah, I know. Uh, you can use Yahoo, which is Bing or whatever you want, but basically it comes down to this. If you're on a desktop, you type in the name of the modem that you are currently using into, Linux, uh, into this search engine and type compatible with, this, uh, with Linux, and it should give you a list of all the Linuxes compatible with your modem. If you have a laptop, a kind of tablet, or any other electronic gadget that you can actually load your own operating system into, well, you just have to type the name of that gadget and the word compatible with Linux and it will give you the Linuxes compatible with this. If it is something that's not supposed to be compatible, you might get the ways of hijacking the hardware to get it to work, in which case you'd still get the gadget to work. So have fun, but that is basically how Linux works. Not all distributions work for everybody, but there is a distribution that should work for you. And the best thing is, is you might have multiple that work for you. You download multiple, you burn them to disks, run them in live mode and have fun. If it doesn't work for you, you don't like it, try the next one and then the next one and then the next one until you find one that you're both happy with and works well with your wireless networking and all your other hardware. Make sure it works with everything that you have. Now, the only downside is, and I'll say it straight out, so I, yeah, I'm not a particular fan of Bell, uh, Dell or any other company, but it takes companies like Dell to force the hand of these bigger companies to make device drivers that are for specific hardware, and the proof is that Dell is starting to sell Linux computers. So you may want to look at buying these devices, but keep in mind, if it takes huge companies like Dell's and other countries to forcibly get these companies to make device drivers by invoking laws that said you have to allow everybody to be able to access your hardware. It is a crying shame that in Asia you can buy a Canon printer that we can buy here and have the drivers in Asia work and not accessible here. All you have to do is translate it. So eventually we're gonna all have to stand up and just bitch and then just go to the other websites and download them and the very worst learn a little bit of Asian in the process so that we can actually understand what is trying to be shown on our screens. It will have to happen one day for Linux users that we come up with a way to make all of these work whether we hack the hardware or not. So very well, I know that most of this practice that we use in this world are based on the idea that everybody is going to either use Microsoft or Apple and that's what the device drivers are designed for. So until that time that we decide to all switch over to Linux and that we decide to kill off expensive hardware like Apple and buzz off with dangerous hardware like Microsoft, we will have to wait. Next week I'll be talking more specifically about an experiment that I'm about currently programming that I will be running this summer on my website and basically for the next year. Uh, remember to like, share, and subscribe to TQA Weekly for more information like our show notes, how to subscribe to our mailing list, our weekly newsletter if you prefer, how to get your own TQA Weekly gear and apparel, and for our Android application, please visit tqaweekly.com. Stay safe and online. Have a great day.